Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malt House Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host today, and with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. Here I be. This is the Malt House Games Podcast. We talk about board games, card games, role-playing games, dice games, tabletop games, and things of that sort, along with beer. Along with beer, and I am very excited about today's beer because this one is one of a four-pack that we picked up about three weeks ago. And we promptly drank the first three. And this one has been staring at us in the refrigerator every time we open the door, just waiting for it to be consumed. Because this is one of the best beers I think we've had all year. This is definitely a Ben beer and a Jesse beer. This is a Ben and Jesse beer uh, for multiple reasons. So this is from Rough Tail Brewing Co. This is Wisconsin Mansion. From the fruited, Wisconsin Mansion. A fruited triple IPA. It says Wisconsin Mansion on the can, Del. You got to pronounce it correctly. Well, the, I was going to get to that, but you're jumping, you're jumping ahead. You mispronounced the beer. I got to correct you. No, Wisconsin Mansion, but it's spelled can, C A N for Wisconsin, Wisconsin, uh, which is why it was going to be a Ben and Jesse beer because A, it's delicious, and B, it fits with Jessie's accent of Wisconsin Mansion. It's how she would pronounce it, and I love it. She has the cutest accent. She is the sweetest person. It is a very northern accent, and so when I read this can, I was like, oh my God, they need it. <laughs> it made me laugh. So we need Ben and Jesse to come down for BGG Con in the next two months, and we will bring you a four-pack. That is, that's how it works, right? Four four-packs. Four four-packs, yes. So, so he has to drink them with us. So Wisconsin Mansion here is a fruited, hazy, triple IPA with peach and mango freeze-dried fruit and puree with Nectaron, Citra, and Idaho 7 hops. And it comes in in a one-pint can that is a whopping 10.5 alcohol by volume. Yes, it is on the par of the same beer we had last week, the uh, Chupacabra Chaps. Don't. There you go. I was trying to be nice to you this morning, uh, but it is from the same Monster series. So this one is like a Haunted Mansion-looking thing. It's really purpley and spooky looking. It's a hat with sunglasses. There are glasses underneath. Well, it's a, it's a mansion too. Yeah, but it's like the mansion that's a top hat. It's cool. It is. It's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and also sunglasses don't fit with that wardrobe, but it's from the same series. And so it's a tall boy. So we're just sharing one today because again, it is a tall boy and it is almost 11% alcohol by volume. And we don't need to take a nap at this time of day. It definitely smells like a tangerine nectarine kind of citrus fruit i skipped straight to taste it smells delicious it's very very hazy just straight cloudy but it tastes like tangerine juice but a hoppy tangerine juice you can tell that there's that mango in there and stuff 10 out of 10 do recommend i give it as Mm. many stars as alcohol by volume that it has it is a great beer it's nice because being a triple ipa and fruited it's not bitter it's not bitter at all it's so well balanced it's way too smooth it is dangerously smooth which again Is why we're just splitting one tall boy. Yes, it is an absolutely delicious beer. It just, it's all fruity, it's well balanced, it's a little sweet, and it goes down way too smoothly for the alcohol content. Amen. So what has been going on since the last episode? Oh my gosh, I have had an incredibly busy, fun, full, packed two weeks. So since last time we met... Uh, We had Labor Day weekend. I spent a lot of Labor Day weekend writing or finishing up writing my training. So last Saturday, I did a training in the morning on collaboration. I did a training in the afternoon on the ethics of incorporating AI and therapy. And that was probably one of the most stressful, one of the most fun trainings I've ever done. I really enjoyed learning about ethics and AI and artificial intelligence. And Delton, I'm going to quiz you. Oh, God. Okay. When was the first AI mental health therapist created? You've told me it's in like the 70s. Nope. 60s. Yes. Ah. It was Eliza created by uh, Dr. Weizenbaum from MIT in 1966, which is unreal how long therapy and mental health have been intertwined. And what I also did not realize is that, so there's basically five founding fathers of AI, and two of them were social scientists slash psychology scholars. And so psychology has always been intertwined with the study of AI, which makes sense because you're trying to replicate the human thought process and human brain. Yeah. Uh, but that was really fun and engaging. And so I talked about emerging research and AI. This week, I also got my ICS slash NIMS 100 and 200 training from FEMA. I wanted to get my incident command systems training. I also went to my uh, ham radio class too. 
And we're starting to learn how we can one day contact the International Space Station once we get our license, which is really fun. And then on top of that, Riley and Lakin came up. We took Lakin to her first hockey game. She really enjoyed the violence. Uh, we got up the next day and had some adventures with Uncle Delk. And we also went to the state fair to go see Disney on Ice. What were some of the adventures we had with you, Delty? Yes, we went to, before they went to the state fair this weekend, we went to a Lego convention called Brick that's on doing like a U.S. tour. Uh, got to see some really cool Lego creations. Uh, they had vendors that were all asking far too much for stuff, but the Lego creations and the different like displays and dioramas and like the especially the one I didn't know we had this, but Oklahoma has a Lego train association. And I looked them up on Facebook and they barely post a thing ever. But it's these people who make these massive Lego train sets. And I started looking into it and you can just build the Lego cars but they actually sell train motors for Lego from Lego for like 12 bucks. And you just have to hook it in to your little wherever, take the remote and then build your car on top of it. And it will then travel. So I might be having to start building me a Lego train set. Cause that sounds awesome. That sounds right up your alley. You've always wanted a train set and you like to sit and tinker and build. And I think this will be really fun and not the nerdiest thing you've ever done. Not the nerdiest thing I've ever done. There's a lot of those though. Uh, after that, you guys went to the state fair. I went to an old vintage music shop to look at their snare drums and just other drum stuff. I bought a new head for my snare, trying to get it to sound good, even though I think the shell might be warped a little bit, so that's fine. Uh, and then I think I came, ho came home after that. But aside from that, we've been playing games, play playing video games, and doing a lot of cleaning. Cleaning out this room, cleaning out the guest bedroom. Yes, cleaning and organizing and mm -hmm. just getting ready, I don't know, just to have some space. Just yes. to have some nice, clean, organized space. And I really appreciate Delton working so hard on that. It's that I tend to keep the boxes to everything in case I need them. And then Haley tends to keep everything. So then we both just have a lot of stuff stored. So I've been going through and throwing away and shredding and uh, organizing and making it where closets are now being much more functional. Uh, I don't know if you can tell in the recording, but this room is much more echoey right now because there's less stuff in here. Uh, I'm going to have to get some more acoustic foam and do a few more things to get it to be a little more preferred on sound for myself. But with all that being said, we have done some cleaning and it's nice. Because we've done some cleaning, we have plenty of space for all of the games that Delton just got in. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's... It's a game. So, as Haley has said now, I had a bunch of hold releases uh, coming in the mail since Portland. There was a few things I added while in Portland that we played with our friends that I said, Haley would like this. This will get me over the free shipping line of our holds. And I had probably seven or eight different boxes show up at the house. Uh, I found out Miniature Market missed one of the orders. I emailed them about it and said, hey, I don't think this one ever shipped. It's in the list here of the seven different orders I've had. And uh, hopefully they get that one sent out. But We've got several, several things in. One of them was something I purchased through Game Nerds on Nerds Day, which is their big annual sale in July. It is Arc Nova. Arc Nova is published by uh, Feuerland, but brought to the U.S. by Capstone Games. It's designed by Matthias Wigge. I guess it's Viga because it's. I think these are all German guys and gals. Just guys. Uh, nope, there's gals. Folks, folks German folks. Uh, graphic design is Christoph Tisch and Stefan Beaker. Illustrations is Loic Billiou and Dennis Lohausen. The cover is Stefan Beaker. Editing and realization is Bastian Winkelhaus, Inga Koitman, and Frank Kieran. Proofreading is Donnie Benna and Nathan Morse. So Arc Nova is kind of a big hit in the board game world lately. It released in 2021, so two years ago. And it has officially jumped to number four ranking on BoardGameGeek.com. Now, BoardGameGeek, as you know, people rank board games. The type of people that rank board games are the type of people you think would rank board games. So even though a game is number one, number five, number 44, doesn't mean that you're going to rank it that highly or that, you know, everyone's going to love it. So keep that in mind. But Arc Nova has recently skyrocketed to number four over the past two years of release, and I have heard... Time and time again, multiple people saying, you should really try it, you should really try it, you should really try it. A lot of people compare it to Terraforming Mars, which we've talked about on the show, and I definitely can see that comparison pretty easily. 
but I've also had every time I bring that up saying, oh, well, I, I have terraforming Mars and everyone says it's just like it. Every single person says, no, it's better or no, I like it much more and it's different enough. And everyone tries to push us to play it. So it was on a good deal sale through Game Nerds on Nerds Day and I picked it up for us to play. The way that Ark Nova works is you are building a zoo. There's going to be a central board of cards that come out. They can either be animals, they could be uh, associate like research cards, essentially, or they could be conservation projects that you'll be able to uh, support to gain conservation points. During the game, you have five different actions that you can take. You can take the cards action, which is essentially going to be drawing cards, Build action, which is building enclosures into your zoo. The animals action, which is placing animals into your zoo. The associate action, which is supporting conservation projects, partnering with countries to make uh, animals from certain countries a discount whenever you put them in your zoo. You don't have to pay as much, things like that. You have sponsors, which are going to be the uh, kind of like, they give you different bonuses. Some of them are anytime you put a reptile in your zoo, you gain some money or every time income happens, you're going to get this extra thing. Those are all five of the actions. And the whole game, you're just going to be doing those actions at different times. Now, what makes this game, to me, the most enjoyable is actually how you go about choosing the actions in which you're taking. Because as you take those actions, you actually have them in a, a row underneath your little personal player board, your personal zoo, and they are numbered, the slots are, from 1 to 5. And that is the power of that slot. So the cards go in those slots, 1 to 5. There can only be one card per slot. If you have a card in the 5 slot, that means, for most of the cards, that it is going to be the most powerful that card can be. For building, you can build the biggest enclosures if it's in the 5 spot. For the associate action, that's going to allow you to support a conservation project if you're at a 5, or you can obviously do anything under that number. The sponsor at a five means you could play a sponsor card from your hand that is a five cost or less. Animals card at the five, you can play two animals from the get-go. So each card gets stronger the further up that track it goes. And then when you use that card, if you say, okay, I'm going to play animals is in my five slot. I'm going to play it. I can put two animals in my zoo as long as I can afford them. Then that animal card is going to go to the one slot and everything else will slide up one value. So whatever was in the ones now in the two, what was in the two is now in the three, and so on. And that to me was one of the most fun and interesting ways that this game presented just a simple choice of action spaces because it made you go, okay, well, I don't, I want to take that, but I don't want to use it yet. I want it to build up one more space. So I need to do one of these other two actions to get it to then push up. And I just think that was a really fun way to to change up how you're taking your actions and also incentivizing you not to just repeat the same action over and over or not to just try to use the same two cards back and forth and back and forth. So the rest of the game is, like I said, you're going to be drawing cards, getting animals, trying to put them in your zoo. There's all different kinds of animals. Uh, they literally do not have any repeats, so every single card is a different animal. And there's peacocks, and there's eagles, and there's tigers, and there's llamas, and there's bunnies, because there's also petting zoos that you can install. There are. There's some special enclosures in your zoo. You can not only have one, two, three, four, and five space enclosures, but you have a three space petting zoo, and you have a five space reptile house and a five space bird enclosure. Like a snake farm. It is a snake farm. It's a reptile house. Yes. Uh, so you have those specialties as well as pavilions and kiosks, which are just single space things that give you a small benefit. The kiosks are essentially some extra income and the pavilion is moving you up on the appeal track, which is one of the tracks that dictate your income. So you're going to be doing that. You're going to be building enclosures in your zoo. You're going to be playing animals into those enclosures. You're going to be playing sponsor cards that allow you to have those bonuses and benefits. You're going to be teaming up with other countries. You're going to be uh, pairing up with some colleges. You're going to be doing all kinds of stuff like that. Moving your appeal tracker up. Uh, every time you play an animal, you get some appeal because people want to come see your zoo. The icon on the track is essentially a ticket, and that dictates how much money you get. But then you also have your conservation track, which runs the opposite direction to your appeal track. They start at either end of the board, and they slowly move toward each other. And once somebody's too tokens to tracks have met at the same region, same space, that's going to trigger the end of the game. 
and whoever has the at that point the highest score is going to win. And the way the highest score works, of course, there's a private goal that you have secretly hidden, and there's some other uh, other little things that you calculate. But the way it's going to work is you actually take the number of the lowest appeal value where your conservation track marker is. So for example, your conservation track, at least once you get past the 10 spot, uh, each conservation point is in the same space as three of the appeal track spots. So if you have a conservation marker on a point where the lowest one is 40, the lowest appeal track is 40, then your other actual appeal marker, let's say it's at 50, you're going to just take the difference of the two, which is a positive 10, and that's going to be your score. So that's how the game's going to score. It's very weird, and we did not know that until we got to the end, and I read, okay, how scoring worked now? And I looked, and I was like, oh, oh, no. And that's how I got negative 20 points the first time we played. Yes, Haley had negative 20, which was brutal, uh, but that's okay. We learned, and you beat me last time. I was 2-0, and undefeated, once against Haley, once against Brian, and then Haley comes in and beats me by one point. One point, but I still beat you. If I would have had one more point, you would have beat me with tiebreaker. So I would have had to get two more points than you to actually win it. But still, you beat me by one point. But the game has a lot going on um, to every animal having some kind of power. They usually move your appeal. Some of them have uh, conservation as well. Some of them also have some other benefit like getting, um, oh, what is it called with the little scholarly hat? Reputation. Reputation, Reputation yes. changes things. Uh, so the big thing in the game is you're doing all this, you're drawing cards, you're playing animals. There are multiple spots in the game where you're able to do something, and you can do it four times but not five. Those are two things. One is if you are partnering with other countries, which give you a discount on animals of that country, you can only partner with five of, sorry, four of the five other countries that you can partner with. You also have the ability, based on wherever you are in the game, to upgrade your action cards. So for example, when you play animals, animal card in the one slot can't do anything. In the two through four, you can play one animal, and in the five, it's a two. If you upgrade the card, which just flips it over, I want to say it's one animal in the one slot, two animals in the two, three, four slot, and then it's two animals and something else in the five. I don't know. There's like extra stuff to it, but it essentially gets better. You can only ever upgrade four of your five actions. Which I learned the hard way the first time we played. Haley learned the hard way, and she was like, how do I get this last one? I was like, I don't know. Hang on. And I start looking, and I go, oh, you can't. Sorry. So keep that in mind. But It gives you a nice decision point. Knowing you can't upgrade everything, knowing you can't partner with every country, it makes you actually look at what you're doing and what how you're approaching your gameplay and your strategy and saying, I think I want to upgrade this card and this card first because I want to focus on doing these things and partner with this one country and not worry about trying to get them all constantly and things like that. So it provides good decision space uh, within a strategy. Everyone's doing the same strategy, but Some people are focusing on birds. Some people focus on herbivores. Some people want predators. And each one has a synergy with itself, which is really nice. I really focused on petting zoos the second game we played. Yeah, you only get one petting zoo. You got to make it count. But you can put three animals in the petting zoo, and each animal bumps your appeal by, I think it's like three for the first animal, six for the second, and like nine for the third. People love petting zoos, man. And that's a lot. That's a lot of appeal. That's a winning strategy right there. That's a, it's at least a good strategy to go for a petting zoo if you have the animals to do it because they're cheap, they're inexpensive, and they don't take up a lot of space. But there's a lot of nuance into this game. There's a lot of small rules of how you fill enclosures and the requirements and how the scorecards work. There's a bunch going on. However, all of it comes down to I have really liked this game a lot. Um, I understand why so many people like it and so many people tout it to be better than Terraforming Mars because. Terraforming Mars was fun, and I enjoyed it, but this one being actually, I'm putting animals into a zoo, and all these different animals, and uh, there's just something about the way that it functions that I'm finding very enjoyable, especially that you can't just take the same action over and over again. That's really nice, too. It doesn't hurt that the artwork and graphic design's a little bit better than Terraforming Mars? It's a lot better than Terraforming Mars. A little bit better? And it's not like their new Terraforming Mars Kickstarter using AI art for everything. Yeah. Which is just a whole other conversation for another episode, I think. to be continued. Yes, but 
uh, it's really fun. Like if you if you like this weight of game, the rulebook is quite hefty. But once you start playing, I promise it makes sense. Haley, we were going through the teach, and I was like, I know it's a lot because I have to throw it all at you right off the bat. But it wasn't how many how many rounds like turns until you were like, all right, I got it. Probably like two or three, and I was like, okay, it clicked. Yeah, it's it's not a difficult game to play once you learn it. It's, it's just a lot to develop a strategy at first. Yes, and the good thing is, not only do they have a rule book that's pretty du- pretty well laid out, aside from one thing that we missed the first time, which is you don't have to take an action with your card. You can move it and just take an X token, which is essentially a bonus. An X token is uh, add one to the strength. So if your card's in a three slot, you can spend an X to make it a four instead of a three without moving the card. We didn't know we could do that in the first play. Yes, and that could have really helped because I feel like the first game, there were many times whenever I had some moves that were not helpful for me in the four and five spot, and I felt like I couldn't move them. The second game, I didn't really come across that very much. I don't think there was a single time I actually moved from the four to five spot to get an X token uh, and, and basically skip my turn. But the first game, I think that would have helped. I think part of that was we missed one other critical rule, which is when you're building in your zoo, it must be adjacent to something you've already built. And then you wouldn't have, you know what I mean? Like that would have progressed you, I think, a little slower. And then it wouldn't have felt like you had actions you couldn't do or weren't helpful. But I don't know. But anyway, uh, yeah. So once you get used to the game, it's not difficult at all. I have I have found it to be very fun. The first time we played it, it was about two and a half hours for just me and Haley, which is pretty long. Me and Brian did it in about the same amount of time. Then me and Haley played it again recently and did it in an hour 40. And I guarantee that we could get it about an hour 15 once you learn, hey, I'm doing this action, then Haley can just do that because I don't have to care and I can just take my turn. Yes, it's easy for actions to kind of overlap with each other. Yes, you can, you can have that where you're like, hey, by the way, I'm picking this. Go ahead. I'm, gonna draw, just, I'm just drawing my cards off the top or I'm just putting this in my zoo. And as long as you know that everyone's following the rules well and stuff, you're good. I don't know that I would ever play this with more than two. Yeah, I feel like that would make it kind of slog on. Uh, unless it's a group that is experienced with the game. Like if everyone knows, oh, they're taking this action. All right, we can keep going. Because if, if Haley says, hey, I'm taking the conservation action. Cool. I don't care. Like I can do my stuff. And so with a four player game like that, I think would be fine. But four players, especially new players, this thing is going to be a chore, I think. Uh, but as a two player game, I actually highly recommend it. I like it a lot. Um, it surprised me how much I've enjoyed it. I will say it does have the issue that I have with Wingspan, which is, oh, I just need this one card. I just need one card to be the, the exact thing I need. And there's a stack of like 400 cards that you're drawing from. You're not going to get it. Uh, so I, I did find that was a thing. Tyler even talked about something that he thinks he would do if he owned it, which is curate the deck to limit certain cards each play. Like one play, there's like essentially, you know, no reptiles and no this. And that way you have a more, a little bit more streamlined card pool, more focused on certain animals to try that. I was like, that would be cool. Because it is a massive deck of cards. It's a huge deck of cards, and they are putting out the Marine expansion. It's currently on pre-order a lot of places. should be in soon. Um, I did not order it yet, but it adds where you can have aquariums and stuff like that. But yeah, so that's going to be Arc Nova. I highly recommend it. I had a lot of fun with it in our, my, my three plays now, and uh, it's one of those games. It's one of the few games at this weight that I feel like sets up easily, and we can play easily and just have a fun time. Like, I enjoy all the other heavy games I have, but some of them are just such a pain to set up and I have to relearn. But this one, I feel like even if I haven't played for a while, it's just not that bad to jump back into. So that's Arc Nova. One of the things with Arc Nova, that, though, that makes it difficult to see how well you're doing during the game is since the score is calculated in such a weird way, you just never know how good somebody is doing. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So the topic of today's episode is score ambiguity, aka the pros and the cons of not knowing your score until the very end or the score of your opponents. So there are a lot of games that do this, which is basically have a very complex way. A lot of times it's considered point salad for some games. Other ones, it's just a hidden thing where you don't know how many points somebody has. Seven Wonders is one of the biggest examples of this because Seven Wonders is essentially the game equivalent of 
you could figure it out, but you have to do a lot of math, and one single person's card play changes that math. And everyone's playing one card, so there's no point in trying to keep up. Right, because somebody you could calculate somebody's scores, and if they're going off of science, if they lay down one more science card, that could drastically and exponentially increase their points. Well, the biggest one is the military. If you're calculating everyone's score and then somebody plays a military card, it not only changes their score, potentially, but also the score of each neighbor next to them. And it could be positive or negative. So it's just one of those things where you're like, ah, oh, what is happening? Yeah, when we played Arc Nova for the first time, like I didn't know how scores were calculated. I thought that was just the green points. And so I was like, oh, man, Same. that's how many points that I get. And then whenever he started to calculate, I was like, oh, no, somehow I got negative 20. But even so, the second time that I played, which is Delton's third time, I still wasn't sure how to calculate my score. So I literally had no idea how well or how poorly I was doing until the end, even though I could see where my little green was. I could see where my tickets were. I could, I knew what my end of game scoring was. I knew what my reputation was. It was still challenging to really know how, how well am I doing? Am I doing a good job? It's one of those games where it talks about points and you want to have the most points. And the way you get points is, you know, making those two tokens cross. But what they don't tell you, which is really how you should approach it, is that it's a race. You are racing to get your tokens together first because if your tokens touch to trigger the end, everyone else gets one turn outside of you and unless it's on a break, which I didn't talk about. Uh, the game doesn't actually have full rounds. Essentially, at a certain point, based on the actions you take, it goes to a break, which is essentially an income phase. Uh, the end game can be triggered during the income phase in which everyone gets another turn. But otherwise, if, it's, if you trigger it on your turn, then everyone else gets one more turn. <clears throat> and it's one of those things where you want your tokens to get together because if you can put your tokens together as fast as you can and be first to do it, you likely have a slight advantage even if someone's close behind. But even so, that last game that we played... I had my tokens cross way before yours did. Like, you still had probably about a 15-ticket gap, and we still only ended a point apart. Yeah, I, had, I feel like I had, a, I had a strong final turn, which also, to be fair, Haley let me essentially redo my final turn because I had two options on my final turn. I had take the route that gets me the most appeal or take the route that gets me the most conservation. And I didn't know which one of those two was the best path to take to try to get the most points when it was almost an equivalent exchange in terms of their positioning. So it was really strange. She let me math it out and do everything and, and kind of take back an, the first action and do it the second way, which gained me two extra points in the end. So it was worth it uh, to do that. So uh, my advice there, always do conservation over appeal if they are at all similar in region because they were like pretty much an identical amount of conservation spaces away, but it still worked out to be better for me to push conservation rather than appeal. Because these are for conservation, too much appeal, and you're a circus. That's very true. That's very true. But this game is a race, and so you don't know how much points, how many points somebody has, or how much you're going to gain at the end. You can calculate that, but you don't really want to calculate how many points everyone else is going to get at the end. So a lot of games do this, like I said. Seven Wonders does this. Um, even games that have a scoring track don't only track that. Even Gugong has some end of game, which, yes, you can calculate those things, so that one's a lot easier, but there are games that do that where they have scores calculated and then they have some end of game scoring that comes up later. So when it comes to not knowing your score up until the end, uh, Haley, for you, is there any pros or cons to that for your like personal sake? Like, How do you feel about it? So uh, for me, I feel like it's more motivating because if you, let's say you're playing a game and you are way ahead of everyone else, then you kind of just feel like you're just maintaining till the end. Maybe you're just kind of like going to the mo through the motions till the end. Or, I mean, you can, maybe you are motivated to like get the like even higher score to just completely cream everybody. But, you know, I find for me, like if I'm like way ahead, then I'm not really as motivated to, you know, get a higher score. Uh, at the same time, like if I'm playing a game or if someone's playing a game and their score is really, really low and there's like no chance of them winning, then it does kind of take away some motivation. I know we've talked about this in the past. I think it was episode 144 with conceding. Like whenever your score is really, really low, like is there a point where you concede? And I say like, no, I'm going to play. I'm always going to play all the way through, I feel like. But it does kind of take away some of that motivation if you feel like there's no chance that I'm going to win. I'm just going to try to get the highest score that I can. 
And so not knowing, like sitting in that ambiguity, you're like, I have no idea how well I'm doing. And so for me, it just motivated me more and more and more and more and more and more and more to try to get the best score that I can. And I feel like if I would have thought that I was winning just based off that, you know, where my where my green, my conservation points were, uh, then I probably wouldn't have won in the end because I would have thought I was so much more ahead than I was. And so being that I kept pushing myself and kept trying to maximize points till the very, very end, that helped me to win by one point, one single point. But what about you? I think that makes sense. And I'm also along the lines of I don't mind not knowing who's winning in the moment unless the game makes it feel like you're doing so poorly. So, for example, we played Gutenberg with Brian and Jessica recently, and I was upgrading all of my skills very highly and doing stuff like that, but I could not keep up with everyone um, during the game. There was one or two turns where I could not fulfill any contracts, and it immediately just put me so far behind And so the whole game, I just felt like I was horribly behind and just had zero chance of winning. And at the end, I wasn't too far off from, I think I was in third though still, or was I, yeah, I think I was in third, but it wasn't too far off from the lead player. But during You're talking like one or two points difference between people. I don't think it was one or two. I'll pull it up while I'm talking. Uh, But it's one of those games where at one point, I was like, I just, is there even a point for me to keep trying? Because I don't think there's any chance of me catching up at all. And then, uh, you know, sure enough, it comes around to it and everything's, everything's okay. Oh, I guess it actually was just a few points. And I was last. So uh, in that one, Jessica came out at 94. Haley had 90. Brian had 89. And I had 88. So it was a very tight game. Literally a point between except for Jessica. But in the middle of the game, if you asked anybody to take a look at the board and state and and stuff and figure it out, I was going to be last place easily. And the problem for me is it depends on the game. Because in Gutenberg, there are like during the game points, right? As you fulfill contracts, you're going to get points for those if you fulfill the contracts and do the stuff. So you'll see the track moving, but then there's other things you do that are only awarded at the end of the game. So in that case, it's easy to see people moving ahead and get discouraged that, well, there's no way I'm catching up at all. And so I prefer, like, I I liked Gutenberg. I thought it was a pretty fun little game. Um, That kind of scoring, though, I would rather either have nothing calculated until the end or all of it on the table at once. Because if it's all on the table at once, then I know for sure if it's just over because I'm doing poorly or if there's a chance for me to still win. Versus when it does both of those things, sometimes I find it discouraging and then end up being happier about it at the end. But it can kind of sour the first play of a game when I don't understand that as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, because there are some games where you know you, you do see the points that are awarded immediately but they're, they weigh heavily on the end game scoring, too. Yeah. And so that can kind of throw you to the loop, too, because you're thinking the whole time, oh, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. But you didn't invest as heavily in the end game scoring, and so you end up getting things turned upside down. Exactly. Then you have the opposite, which is the score is known at all times, which is, I feel like, a lot of games, but the one that comes to mind the most for me is Pax Pamir, Pax Pamir 2nd Edition, where you know the score, and if any single person, whenever a dominance check happens, is, I think it's a dominance check, is that the correct term? Or is that in dominant species? That's at the end of the game for dominant species. Yes, it's dominance check, but, but like it, it, yeah, control yeah. check or something like that. Yes. Whenever that happens, if any single player is four points or more, or sorry, greater than four points, I think it is, ahead of the second place player, then they just win the game. So it's one of those games where you're, constantly aware of how many points somebody has and how many points you need to make sure that they can't win the game. And that gives the game just a different feel, though. The good thing about that game is if somebody's points get far enough ahead, it's just over. It's not going until the end of a certain amount of time in the game, and then whoever has the most points wins. So I do think that it found the nice balance there because some games that are like, oh, here's the score, and you're playing, and you're moving your points, and you're playing, and you're moving your points, and you see there's no chance for you to win, but there's 45 more minutes of this game, that can be very frustrating. But Pax Pamir says, 
oh, there's no chance for anybody. This person's far enough ahead. They just win the game. It's over. So it can end very quickly as we one time have had happen where I won the game in like 30 minutes because it was, uh, you had played it once, I think, or twice, and the other people had played it none. And it just worked out that I was able to win quickly. But then we said, let's keep playing though, because now you understand how that's going to work. And then we kept going. But uh, this kind of thing is, I feel like a very divisive topic for people. Some people love knowing the score all the time. Some people love not knowing the score all the time. I think it depends on how the game approaches it. But for me, I probably lean with not knowing majority of the score until the end. I agree. If I have no idea what my score is until the end, then I feel like, I mean, personally, do I want to know that I'm winning? Yeah, that's great. But not knowing my score, I feel like is is helpful for the players as well. I think it keeps folks engaged longer because you have no idea yeah. where your stand is. Now, you know, some folks, I remember when we played a, a Lancaster with a friend and the whole time she thought she was losing, she thought she was losing. And that kind of soured her, her gameplay. And so that kind of came out and how she talked about the game and whatnot. But then at the end, she won and it, it changed her mind. And so I know for some that might not be the case and that's okay. Because some folks, if they don't know, then they automatically think that they're losing. And that's okay if you don't like those kinds of games. I think for me, it keeps me guessing. It keeps me me engaged. And I think for you, for the most part as well. Yes. It's, it's the same for me. Uh, like I said, it's about 80%. Like Gugong, most of the points are going to be immediate. But there are a good amount of in-game points that will happen, if I remember correctly. Uh, even though it's been a second since I've played now. But Gugong, your points can jump quite drastically at the end or at the end of each round. Uh, but it's nice because you know kind of where everyone is, but then those in-game scoring is variable enough that it's uh, an excitement, but it's also not so variable that you still don't have a clue who's got a chance kind of thing. you know. But I don't know. I enjoy it. Uh, but I think that's kind of where it just comes out. And I think everyone's going to have their own preference. And obviously different games, I mean, Quacks, you know everybody's score the entire game. Doesn't matter. Quacks still fun. Like, some games are just going to be fine, even if they're opposite of your normal preference. And I think that we talk about that kind of crap on this podcast all the time. Tons of options. Everyone has a preference. Everyone also has a game that goes against that preference that they still love. Welcome to hobbies. Like, <laughs> that's just how it is. But uh, yes, well, with uh, the score of this podcast being mostly calculated, there's still some in-game scoring coming up with the question. Oh, no. Join us for a Malthouse Games podcast special, Pint Size Question. So for the question of this episode, I actually have the hiccups. So question of the episode is, what is your favorite hiccup remedy? Uh, put your fingers in your ears and wiggle them real strongly. I'm wearing earphones, but I'll try that here in a minute. My favorite was eating a slice of bread. Because apparently... Just dry? So what my uh, fourth grade teacher instructed me on... Uh, excuse me, is that the hiccups are chest mus muscle spasm and that eating bread calms it. I don't know if I've ever, ever actually tried that. I know I've tried out your method on air here on the podcast where I put my fingers in my ears and wiggled it, and it did in real time stop my hiccups. But I'm going to try that, and I'm going to eat some bread because I'm hungry. I'm also hungry. Uh, yeah, I do the ear wiggling. I read about it online, uh, and essentially there is – it's not a foolproof thing, but there is – a little bit of science to it because something about when you stimulate your ears in that manner, there's a certain nerve that runs through the chest that is the same or next to the nerve that causes the spasms. I don't know, something going on, but there's like a decent chance that it helps your hiccups. It's not a foolproof thing, but that's, I think the hiccups for me, my, my cure for them. It worked. No, it didn't. Just kidding. <laughs> I thought it did. It's, it's, it's hit or miss, but it's fine. Uh, anyway, I think that's everything for the podcast episode today. I want to give a big shout out to our amazing Patreon patrons. Thank you so much to Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff for supporting us on the podcast at a level in which you get shouted out on the podcast, supporting us on Patreon. There we go. Uh, if you would like to be like them and our other amazing patrons, head over to patreon.com slash Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can also find us on all social media at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can send us an email to contact at malthousegames.com. If you have a game you think we should look at, a topic you want us to cover, a question that you want us to answer, or a beer that you think we should find to talk about on the show. You can find 
uh, Haley on social media. I missed this part at S Q U I R R E L Y G E K. That is at Squirrely Geek. I think that that's everything for this episode. I've got to get to editing because we're on a time squeeze this weekend. So I want to make sure to get this done before Sunday at noon. So that means thank you again for tuning in. And until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye.